I've been preaching for 32 years from a piece of paper today because of this, because I have vision problems. Uh, I am going to do this from this little device. I was going to put more things on this table, but you know, I'm already kind of crowded up as it turns out. So I'm going to, I'm going to talk from this, this little gadgetry here today. We have some friends that will be joining me in a moment. Luke chapter 19. Today, by the way, Luke chapter 19, we are looking at one of the most familiar guys from the Bible for all kinds of reasons. His name is Zacchaeus. Now, my first encounter with Zacchaeus did not come from a sermon or from, uh, and I didn't have any friends named Zacchaeus, uh, not from a sermon, not from a Sunday school lesson, it came from a song, right? How many of you know this song? And we're willing to come up and stand here and do the hand motions to it while I, well, no takers, okay. So it's a song about Zacchaeus, and here's what we know. Zacchaeus was a, he was a wee little man, and a wee little man was he. He climbed up in a sycamore tree for the Lord he wanted to see. And as the Savior, yeah, he looked up in the tree and he said, You come down, for I'm going to your house today. This is why I don't lead the music here at our church. <laughs> that's, that's what would have happened to every song we sang today. It would have been as smooth and flawless as that. Zacchaeus. Now, what we're going to do today is we're going to read this story of Zacchaeus from Luke chapter 19. But I want to start out not with verse 1, where the story starts, I want to start with verse 10, because here's where, here's where we want to go with this. In this series, we're talking about not just that Jesus came, but why he came. And verse 10 tells the story. It says, for the Son of Man came to seek and to save the lost. Why did Jesus come? He didn't come to create a beautiful manger scene. If you stop at the manger, you stop way short of the reason Jesus came. You want to go on, because the story always with Jesus, it goes to the cross. So that's where we're headed with this thing. He came to seek and save that which was lost. He came looking for you. He came looking for me. Here's what God's Word says. This from Luke chapter 19, verse 1. It says, he, it's referring to Jesus, he entered Jericho and was passing through. And behold, there was a man named Zacchaeus. He was a chief tax collector and was rich. He was looking to see who Jesus was, but on account of the crowd, he could not because he was small in stature. So he ran on ahead and he climbed up into a sycamore tree to see him, for he was about to pass that way. When Jesus came to the place, he looked up and he said to him, Zacchaeus, hurry, come down, for I must stay at your house today. So he hurried and came down and received him joyfully. And when they, they saw it, the, the they here, it's, the, it's all those people who are always looking for something to accuse Jesus of, to attack Jesus for. When they saw it, they all grumbled. He has gone to be the guest of a man who's a sinner. Zacchaeus stood and said to the Lord, Behold, Lord, the half of my goods I give to the poor. And if I have defrauded anyone of anything, I restore it fourfold. And Jesus said to him, Today salvation has come to this house, since he also, talking about Zacchaeus, is a son of Abraham, for the Son of Man came to seek and to save the lost. Okay, we dig into a story like this. And we, got two key, we have uh, two key figures. We have Zacchaeus. And then we have the star of the show anytime you start reading the Bible. That's going to be Jesus. Everything revolves around Jesus in a story like this. So we want to focus in on the Savior. We're going to start out with Zacchaeus. Zacchaeus represents every person who doesn't yet know Jesus as Savior and Lord. So Zacchaeus is, is the normal guy because most people you're going to run into, most people you know, and most people in this world do not know Jesus as Savior and and Lord. They're the normal folks, the ordinary folks that are out there. There are different ways we talk about these people. Some, we say, well, they're unbelievers. And at least for a season, maybe, they are not a believer in Jesus, that he 
is the Savior. He's the only way to salvation. He died on the cross, but sins of the world, raised from the dead. Uh, they're unbelievers, but, but you know what? There's coming a day when every knee shall bow and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. There's coming a day when everyone's going to believe. But if you don't make that step in this life, you're going to enter eternity separated from God. Another way that people uh, talk, about, talk about this, they say, well, there's some people who are unchurched. And there's a, there's a lot to be found in that little unchurched phrasing. But the thing about unchurched is it can create a, a false idea in our minds that the main thing is just you go to church. And if you go to church, everything's going to be good. But there are a lot of people who are spiritually separated from God who are in church every Sunday. Going to church doesn't save you any more than living in a garage makes you an automobile. You are separated from God. Unchurched, uh, there's some value there. Not, uh, not all we're looking for. A few weeks ago, uh, we were out in the community praying with people sharing the gospel, and we got to talk to a guy uh, within a couple of blocks of where I'm standing right now, and we started sharing with him, and he said, you know, if I was going to describe myself, I'd describe myself as a pagan. Uh, Louise remembers, uh, Louise Phillips is with me, remembers this guy. I'd, I'm a pagan. Well, you might describe yourself as a pagan. The reason he said he was a pagan, he said, I'd rather be a pagan than a Christian, because I know too many people who go to church that they don't live as good a life as I do. I know what they're like when they're away from that church building. So I describe myself as a pagan. Some people, lost is a pretty good, pretty good way to say it. Uh, Jesus came to seek and save that which was lost. People who spiritually lost, separated from God. But just recognize this. Lost isn't a bad, condemning sort of way to frame this. Lost doesn't mean you're evil or you're bad or you're condemned. Uh, if, uh, if I lose my, my microphone here, it doesn't mean any of those things. It just means the microphone's in the wrong place. It's not where it needs to be to accomplish the purpose for which it was created. It's lost. We want, to, we want to find people who are spiritually lost and let them be in the middle of what God plans for their life, God's perfect design, perfect plan for their life. So that's a little phrasing of different people. And Zacchaeus, we find he's, he just, he's just a guy. And Zacchaeus is a guy, he didn't know he was lost. If you were going to ask, tell me, Zacchaeus, what's your core problem? He wouldn't say, oh, I'm spiritually lost. That's not the first thing that would have come to mind for Zacchaeus. He had plenty of other things. He's, he's looking, he's filling all kinds of gaps in his life with all kinds of other things, but he's not sure exactly where he's missing the boat. See, there was a time in my life when I was Zacchaeus. I knew something wasn't right. I knew something was broken in me. Something wasn't connecting for me, but I didn't know what it was until someone told me about Jesus. Every person, <clears throat> until someone shares, until someone points the way, uh, they may not know they're lost. We'll fill in a lot of blanks with other things, lesser things, but everybody's a Zacchaeus at some point in their life. And there are a couple of different ways we all relate, all relate to Zacchaeus. First thing about Zacchaeus is he's a guy that just reminds us none of us really measures up. Now, uh, in that phrasing, one of the things we know about Zacchaeus from God's Word is Zacchaeus is a fellow who's vertically challenged. You know what I'm talking about when I say vertically challenged. Scholars tell us that in the first century, the average Jewish man would have, uh, would have clocked in at around five foot one inches tall. This is due to diet, genetics, a lot of other things. But first century Jewish man, five foot one. Zacchaeus can't see over that towering five foot one guy in front of him to see Jesus. And so that's where the problems start coming in for him. So he has to find a different way to make things work. And so uh, when I think about Zacchaeus, you have a, have to, I have a picture. You ever done this? You have a picture of every one, every one of these biblical characters, what you think they would have looked like? I mean, I've, I've got Paul, and I've got Peter. I have all these people. That, this is what they look like. When I think about Zacchaeus, okay, he can't see over the guy, average height, five foot one, so we're going to say he is four foot ten, which makes him the same height as actor Danny DeVito. And when I think about Zacchaeus, <laughs> I always think Danny DeVito. That's, the, that's the, kind of the picture that comes to my mind of what Zacchaeus is like. 
And any of you like to go uh, have a physical? No, I do it. Rhonda makes me. Uh, and there's nothing that goes well in a physical. They're, they're looking for your deficits. They're looking for where, where you, you're not doing well. And that's the frustrating part for me of a physical. And all, all of my doctor visits, and this has happened again recently, the, the story's always the same. You know, Chad, at your age, what is that supposed to mean? So I go to get my physical. And it reminded me of this guy. He went to get a physical. And same struggle. He's dreading it, what they're going to say, what they're going to call for from him. And he went into the first physical, and he's in the waiting room. And then, okay, come on back for your physical. And he walks down the hallway with the nurse, and the nurse stops and says, okay, how much do you weigh? And he said, well, I weigh 170 pounds. She said, well, climb on the scale. Okay, Let's see, 200 pounds. Now, uh, how tall are you? He said, I'm right at six foot tall. She said, well, stand right here. You're five foot eight and a half. Let's go back here to the examination room. She took him back to the examination room. She said, let's check your blood pressure. He said, how in the world do you think I'm going to get a normal blood pressure reading? I came in here as a tall, slender guy. You have reduced me to this. See, when it comes to God's standard, none of us quite measures up the way we think we, we'd like to or think we, we, we could. None of us measures up. You know what the Bible says in Romans 3.23? How many have sinned? All have sinned. And they fall short of the glory of God. The glory of God. The standard of God. The standard of perfection. The standard that is Jesus Christ. And we're all just going to come up really short when we're measured against that standard. Jesus is the name that's above every name. And the first step, if if we're going to get around to working on lost, we're going to have to get to a spot where we recognize, I, I don't measure up, nor can I measure up. There's nothing I can do to manufacture what is required by God. Not by good works, not by all the religious stuff. Nothing I can do is going to get me there. And here's the second thing about Zacchaeus. Zacchaeus was rich, influential. He would have had a lot of stuff. And he was an unhappy camper. There's something missing in his life. See, for Zacchaeus, he knows there's something that's not the way it should be. Something is broken. Something is missing. Something is out of, out of joint. Here's how we know. Because he was desperate. You know how desperate Zacchaeus was? As Jesus is coming through Jericho, the crowds started lining up. And he runs ahead of the crowds because he knows I'm not going to see anything because of the vertical limitations. I'm going to have to move on down. And it says he ran on ahead. Now, you need to put this in context. A, a, A dignified, influential Jewish man in the first century you just don't run. That's what undignified people do. That's why in trying to live a biblical lifestyle, I don't ever run anywhere. I walk slowly. That's the way it was intended in the Bible. So I'm not going to be a runner for you. Now, but he, he ran on the head. You know why I'm a man in the first century is running? Because he's desperate. And then he did something else. Now, I was a tree climber growing up. We had big trees our place in Victoria, Texas. I love climbing trees. One of the things in one of my, uh, oh, man, it was probably 10 years ago now. I was in for a physical. My doctor said, now, Chad, men your age, again, men your age, one of the leading causes of death for men your age, accidents at home. doing dumb stuff that a leading cause of death for guys like me doing dumb stuff at home you know that whole thing i think i can fix that you know the famous last words i wonder where that goes yeah we don't need a call repairman it's all those things that gonna come back to haunt you and one of the things i learned is i should not climb trees anymore you know some say you've heard my story before i was 
I was on the top of a 12-foot wooden ladder in Stamford, Texas. This is I was in my mid-30s and uh, trimming a pecan tree. And I just had a saw, and I was just sawing away. And I was pretty sure how that limb was going to go. It was about this big around. That thing swung around, and it was like a cartoon because it just, it just hit on the wooden ladder, and it just went off. And I jumped from the top of the ladder, and it just went, bop, 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 and knocked out every rung on that ladder. Would have killed me, I guess. I was not even to stop climbing trees. Zacchaeus climbed a sycamore tree. Dignified, influential men, and the first, Jewish men in the first century didn't climb trees. There's only one reason you climb a tree, and that's because you're desperate to get away from something, to get to something. Desperation will cause you to run, and it'll cause you to climb a tree. So what, what we find in Zacchaeus is it's a desperate act. He had this, he had this longing, an itch in his heart that all of his wealth couldn't scratch. Uh, and he probably didn't even know what he needed. He just knew, I desperately need something. And when he heard Jesus was in town, he was hoping maybe Jesus is the answer to this. He wasn't sure what Jesus was going to be able to offer. What, what he didn't know is he was looking for God. The reason he was there is to look for God. And a lot of people, they don't know what they're looking for. But what they're looking for is they're looking for God. Back in, the, back in the olden days, I always got my letter. In fact, I started filling them out when I got to seminary. I was in Fort Worth, a starving seminary student, and publishers, clearinghouse, sweepstakes letters. And I would fill out those uh, publishers, clearinghouse, sweepstakes letters. I never won a penny. Now, publishers, clearinghouse, to promote the magazines that they represented, they, they'd send out those letters. Now, you can still do this online. I don't think they send out the letters anymore. At least they quit sending them to me. They, Figured I was a dead end, but Publishers Clearinghouse. And what was fascinating back in the day about those is they were one of the first, first organizations I ran into that personalized letters, computerized letters. So that if you remember how it went, your name would appear in bold print all through the letter. Chad, you may have already won. Chad, you're one of our finalists for this contest. Like, oh, it's just down to me and Rick Hands, you know, it's just me and Rick. And, well, no, there's, it, there are millions of people still out there. There was no tightly defined, I got a shot at this kind of a thing going on. So, uh, in that context, there was, uh, there was a church, Bushnell Assembly of God, the Bushnell Assembly of God Church. It was a church just outside of Tampa, Florida. Well, a lot of times businesses got these letters too. The computer wasn't that discerning. The technology not that great. So it would go to businesses as well. So the Bushnell Assembly God, the publisher's clearinghouse letter came to the church and it was personalized by the computer. And here's what it said. Dear God of Bushnell Assembly. So that's how it was, how it was headed. And then it starts filling in the blanks in this form letter. God, we've been searching for you. You're a finalist to receive our $11 million sweepstakes. So don't just sit there, God. Return your sweepstakes form today. Uh, the Tampa Tribune picked up on this story, heard about it, and they went and interviewed the pastor. The pastor, and it was just you know, interesting local human interest sort of story. And the pastor did indicate he was not going to complete the form on behalf of God, that God was squared away financially and would not require that. But humorous as it is, uh, that one sentence just jumped out to me, and I've saved it for, for years now. God, we've been looking for you. There's a whole lot of truth in that statement. People today are looking for something. They're looking for God, and they'll call, they'll call it happiness or purpose or success and they'll look for it in a lot of places, right? They look for it in Collin County. Well, if I just make enough money, uh, I'll feel it. If, uh, if, I, if I rise high enough in the corporate structure, if, uh, if I have the right car, the right house, uh, the right relationships, everybody's looking to fill this, this gap and, and settle things. And what happens? You do all those things, and it still doesn't satisfy, and you still feel the emptiness inside. So then what do you do? Well, you know what? 
over the last few months in these United States of America, we have a whole set of people who they're rich and they're successful and they're powerful, but none of that satisfied the longing in their soul. So they said, well, we're going to have to do something more extreme, something more dangerous, something more thrill-seeking. And they've wrecked their careers, and they've wrecked their marriages, and they've wrecked their whole families and their reputations in the world because they were looking everywhere except, except to the Lord. Some of you walked in today, and you're looking for something, uh, something to satisfy, something to fill a gap. Maybe you, you came in today just thinking, perhaps religion's the thing. Maybe just sitting with a bunch of people who are th- talking about God's stuff. Maybe that's what I need today. But listen, Jesus is here today with us, and this, this could be the end of your search. So I want to talk about the Jesus part of this story. And, I mean, I, when, I, when I look at biblical characters in, the, in, in, in Scripture, like Zacchaeus, I see myself a lot in Zacchaeus. And one of the things I really appreciate about this, this whole story is that while Zacchaeus is looking for something, Jesus comes looking for Zacchaeus. Jesus is already on a mission to find Zacchaeus. <clears throat> this is the good news. You're searching for God, he's searching for you. And that's why Jesus came to the earth. The Son of Man, Jesus, came to seek and save that which was lost. He came for all the, all us Zacchaeuses out here. And this is, this is the greatest rescue mission in the history of the world. Jesus coming to this broken world looking for lost people. He came all the way from heaven to find a guy named Zacchaeus and a guy named Chad. A lot of you. Luke 19 When we get to Luke 19, Jesus is on a deliberate path to Jerusalem. Uh, By the time we get this late in the gospel, every step Jesus takes is toward the cross. This is where he is headed. It's just a matter of days. He's going to die on the cross for the sins of the world. But he goes through Jericho because you're coming down from the, he's been up north. He's coming down. He crosses back across the Jordan at Jericho. And in Jericho, God has set up a couple of divine appointments for him. One of them is with a blind man named Bartimaeus. And the other appointment Jesus had is with a dirty, rotten scoundrel named Zacchaeus. And both these guys are desperate, desperate for something, desperate for God. Some of you are seeking God today, too. And the way Jesus related to Zacchaeus is the same way he wants to relate to you. He is looking for you. Now, I have a couple of friends going to come up and help me here. Trent Cox and Taylor Ramsey are going to come and join me. And uh, they did such a great job. Welcome them today. It's scary to come up here. Now, uh, in, in 2017, our church has engaged in, in reaching out to our community in a way I just never imagined possible. What God's done, what you have done to to follow the Lord, and uh, one of my favorite parts about what we've been doing is seeing how God, while we're doing what we do, He's way out in front of us, putting things together before we ever get to a spot. He's already orchestrated a plan, and He's carrying it forward, and so one of my favorite things is dropping in the middle of what God's already doing. So we want to, got a couple stories here we want to share with you about that. Now Trent, tell us a little bit first just about you, your family. How long have you been at the church? Yeah, so Trent Cox, um, and I am an IT director at Raytheon, and uh, I am married to a beautiful, most kind person I know, Rachel Cox, for 18 years. Got it right this time. <laughs> we had um, a little, uh, it was a little vague at the first hour, practice. so you wanted to work that out before she was in the That's building. Good, good practice session. Mm-hmm. Um, and I have two daughters, uh, Taverly and Tennyson, and we've been going to First Baptist of Allen for about eight years. Awesome, awesome. Now, uh, Tell me a little bit about your story, and, and, I, and, I, and I love your story, because we've been, we've, been visit, we've, we've been reaching out to our community, but then we're also looking for opportunities. Uh, since oh, a year and a half ago, I guess, we started praying uh, Luke 10, 2. Uh, the harvest is plentiful, but the labors are few. Pray the Lord of the harvest. We call out labors for the harvest. So we've been looking, where are the opportunities to engage more people in reaching people for Jesus. And uh, so, Trent, tell us your story. It's a great story. 
Yeah, so as I said, I'm, a, I'm an IT director, and so earlier this year I was at a really large uh, conference, this IT conference, and, um, and when I say large, I mean it's one of the largest in the world. So there's 40 or 50,000 people here, um, extremely busy from morning till night, you're a packed agenda, every, you know, you don't have five minutes essentially of free time barely in between these things, and um, so it's one of the last places that I was anticipating some sort of divine appointment. Right, but guess what? God's working there too, and uh, you just have to be uh, paying attention. And so, uh, the the keynote speaker the very first day was a was the CEO of this really large technology company, and he's up on stage. And during his speech, he kind of gets into a lot of what I would call, I guess, spiritual things. Um, and by spiritual, I don't mean biblical. Uh, mm. I, I mean a lot of uh, me, 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 and you, 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 and you know, self fulfillment kind of kind of items. But a lot of people resonate with those kind of things, and uh, and so anyway, along the way, as the day went on, uh, a colleague of mine who is a Christian, and we had spoken about things, um, you know, about church and other things, and 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 got at work a few times, and she texts me and says, "I just can't believe this guy. Can you?" Can you believe the, you know, what, what he's saying in front of all these people and all this kind of stuff? And we texted back and forth. But later in the day, a break occurred, and we happened to meet up. And she says, and she brings it up again and says, you know, I just feel like that we're being pushed out of the world. Mm. That, you know, guys like this essentially are, are all you hear uh, nowadays, right? And I said, well... You know, there's only so much room in the world for just anything, right? You've talked mm. about your time and what you mm. fill it with in the past and things like that. And, and I said, you know, we've been talking at my church here lately about this uh, a statistic that really resonates with me about how 98% of self-proclaiming Christians have never directly shared the gospel with another person. And so maybe the reason why we're being, you know, sort of pushed out is because we're not willing to push back. Right? We, we're not willing to share uh, what we know and the truth that's out there and other people are. And so I, at that point, I pulled out my phone and I've got this sticker on my phone. And Chad's going to talk about this later, but uh, this three circles sticker. And it's a really simple but very biblical way to share the gospel with someone. It's very unintimidating and you can't believe the kind of results that you get and, and the 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 impact that it has on people when you share it. And so I shared this with her and I, uh, the three circles. And I said, you know, um, this has really been doing something in our, in, in our church and in our neighborhoods and in our, in our towns and, and around the world, frankly, uh, it's been shared now. And so anyway, we go on and, and she responds to it in a very positive way and is, is saying, you know, I can't believe this. I've never seen anything like it, all those kind of things. But we go on with our busy day. We go on with the conference a week later I'm at, I'm at work, and I get a phone call, and she calls me, and, and, it, and it's Misha on the other end of the phone line. And she says, uh, you know, I've been thinking about what you shared with me, and um, God won't let me go. You know, that's exactly what she said. She said, I, I, I can't get away from this. And... Um, you know, she goes on to say that she's been very involved in her church. She's done lots of things, but honestly, she's one of those 2% right? Um, it, it, one of the 98%, I'm sorry. And, um, you know, never really directly shared the gospel with somebody before. And so she asked me to train her on the three circles and said, me and my family are going to start going out and we're going to start knocking on doors. Because um, I, I, I can't, I, I can't keep from it. I have to. Um, so anyway, my daughter Tennyson filmed me one day at my house uh, doing the three circles on a dry erase board. And uh, I sent it over to her, and uh, we got her in touch with the, the people who are leading the No Place Left in Tucson, Arizona, where she actually lives. And, um, and she's going to start going around and sharing, sharing the gospel with people and uh, sharing it with her church. That's awesome. I got, <clears throat> God's already stirred something in her. It connects with, with you and workplace and goes forward ways that really bring God glory. I may not survive it, Taylor. Um, so that's a, yeah, I have to go. Uh, this is a speaker's secret. That's what it's called. Actually, entertainer's secret. So bring on the show business, Trent. It's a, <clears throat> it's a combination of uh, aloe vera and uh, 30-weight motor oil. 
<laughs> It'll fix most of what ails you. Now, uh, <clears throat> yeah, just how, how God, God's always at work. He's engaging people in his purposes, which is to share the gospel. And so, uh, well, I love Trent's story because it's here, 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 and God puts it all together in this beautiful package. Now, Taylor Ramsey, <laughs> welcome. Tell, me, tell us a little bit about you. Okay, so I'm Taylor Ramsey. My parents are Ross and Jill Ramsey. I am a freshman in high school, and I have two little brothers that are 10 and 12, and I've been going to this church around five years. All right, we're glad to have you here, Taylor. And Taylor's been very active in uh, our reaching out to the, to the city. And uh, Trent and I are talking about this. Taylor, Taylor got her driver's permit what, the last week or so? Yeah. Yeah. And I've already locked the keys in the car. Yeah. So. You already locked your keys in your car. Well, that's, a, that's also a rite of passage. Once you get a driver's permit, you lock your <laughs> keys in your car, and then you're ready to take on 75, I guess. Uh, all right. Well, welcome. Now, Taylor has a great story, but we also, as we're telling a lot of stories, we had so many good stories. We're telling lots of stories. Well, we captured kind of a backstory to what she's going to share with you. And we want to share that in about a minute and a half video. So uh, turn your attention to the screens. Hi, my name is Angel and I'm from Kansas. I was born in Kansas City and I live in Allen. I've been here for a few months and I'm here to tell my testimony. <laughs> All right, hey Angel, um, tell me a little bit about the night those people from our church came to your house, your apartment. Well, before they came, I was in my closet praying. I was going through a lot of things at home and dealing with a lot of personal things. And I was like, please, I like got on my knees and I prayed. I was like, please send somebody that will help me get closer to Jesus. And the next thing you know, Jill and Taylor and Mark came. My mom says, don't open the door to strangers, but I don't know, I had this feeling. I was like, something told me to answer the door. So I was like, I answered it. It was Taylor, Jill and Mark. And I was like, why are they at my door? And they were like, hi, we're from the church around the corner. And I was like, okay. <laughs> but they shared the three circles with me. And I don't know, I got really emotional and I was like, he answered, I was so thankful to God because he answered my prayers right away because sometimes it takes time. And I was like, wow, he's really listening to me. And I'm glad he was. And I'm so thankful for that. Okay, Taylor, so this is, this is Angel. And Angel is in her apartment, not far from the church. And she's praying. And then you guys show up. So pick up the story there. So then what happens? Yeah, okay, so... Me, Jill Ramsey, and Mark Carpenter were knocking on apartment doors, and so we happened to knock on this one apartment, and a beautiful young lady opens the door, and she, you could tell she was like a little weirded out that we were there because she didn't know who we were. And so we asked her how we could pray for her, and she went into some family issues that have been going on. And so basically we just prayed for her and for those family issues. And then from there we got to bridge over into the gospel. And so you could just tell she was ready, like she was there. And so after, you know, describing the gospel a little more and answering some of her questions, um, she ended up praying to receive Christ. And so it's been super cool because every Tuesday since then we've been able to meet up with her for discipleship and she's actually brought on her mom. And so we've been able to disciple her mom and she's been coming out to the harvest with us too. So she came to one of our 401 trainings and then she came out to the harvest with us and brought along some of her friends. And one of her friends left the harvest and went back to her home and shared three circles with her mom. And so um, it's been really cool to see Angel just you know, use her spirit of influence. She's been able to share with her boyfriend and her friends and has been able to disciple them. And she also found a church and got baptized. And so it's just been super cool just seeing the Lord use her. Um, and so, yeah. That's a great story. And, and the, the wonderful thing about it, see, uh, Angel, she accepted Christ and she's baptized. Not here. She found, and this is one of the things that's foundational to, to what we're about as a church is we want to help people connect with Jesus, connect to local churches, but it's about the kingdom of God, not about the kingdom of here. We, we want to reach the world for Christ and, and whatever ways God orchestrates that. And also on this story, uh, and we have a whole set of these stories now, several of these where somebody says, I'm praying, and then somebody 
God, you got to send somebody. God, you got to help me. And then somebody comes and knocks on my door. You know what a freak out moment that is for somebody to, God, to answer that readily, that powerfully. And yet we got a, we have a, a couple of dozen of those stories now where God's at work and he's already working in a heart and there's a seeking soul and they meet up with uh, some willing witnesses and inter- the willing witnesses introduce them to this loving Savior. What a great, great story. I appreciate y'all so much sharing these stories. We have, come, come and join like these folks. Jump in. You're going to have some stories to tell because that's how God does things. He's always at work. God bless y'all. Thank you. Appreciate y'all. All right. The chance of both of them having some terrible disease now is about 50-50 based on sitting up here with me. No. <clears throat> It's vocal difficulties. Hey, so here's some things to note when it comes to you and Jesus. And uh, the first thing is the first thing Jesus said to Zacchaeus. Do you notice what it was? He says, Zacchaeus. Jesus calls him by name. Now, Zacchaeus had been called a lot of names in his life probably. Uh, his own given name, probably not so much. But he'd been called a lot of other bad things because he was a bad guy in his, in his community. And he must have thought, how does Jesus know me? How does Jesus know my name? Now, Jesus knew his name for the same reason he knows your name, because he's God. He knows everybody's name. God said in Isaiah, and Isaiah's declaring, this is the word of the Lord, fear not, for I have redeemed you. I have called you by name. You are mine. You may think you're all alone in this world. Nobody knows you. Nobody knows your story. Nobody knows what's stirring in your heart. Nobody knows the burdens you came walking in here with today. The God who created the universe, he knows all those things, and he cares about you. Here's the second thing. God knows what you need, and what you need is a relationship. So Jesus calls his name, Zacchaeus, and then he invites him to come down from the tree. And I think at that point, the community around that would all hated Zacchaeus. He's a betrayer to his country. Uh, he's, he's a Jewish guy who's, who's abandoned his own people to work for the Romans. And then he's skimming off the top because he was manipulating people, stealing from them. He was a dishonest guy, and most of them were, who'd taken on that responsibility. And I think that the community, they're looking, they said, oh, we've been waiting for this day. Because this guy, Jesus, we know he's a religious guy, and he's about to turn loose on this guy, Zacchaeus. Zacchaeus, you are one sorry individual. You are the worst of the worst. God has no place for you. God's going to zap you, lightning bolts from heaven, flames of fire at your feet. You are in deep trouble. God's going to bring judgment to bear on you. It's like the the song. We did this in the first hour, so people really got into it. What does he say? Zacchaeus, you come down. Well, we shook it with an angry face and with a violent finger when I was growing up. I don't think that's how Jesus said, did it? Not with a, here's what's wrong with you. Zacchaeus, come down, because I want to go to your house today. And, and not to chew you out. I want to go to your house to share a meal with you. Now, that, that's a pretty big deal, because uh, Zacchaeus, not coming to condemn sinners, but to save sinners. What Zacchaeus needed was needed a personal relationship to Jesus. And Jesus enters into a relationship. You share a meal in the first century. That, the, thing, the whole thing of hospitality is lost to us so much. We, we tend to live uh, isolated once we get into our homes. Uh, but opening your home to other people, inviting others, share a meal, it's a great biblical application and still has tremendous applications for uh, creating openness and relationship with people today that open up to gospel conversations. Jesus doesn't come to condemn him. He says, I want to share a meal with you companionship, relationship, fellowship. And we don't know what, the, what happened inside that house, all of what stirred this, but I think once you get to know Jesus, you start seeing everything about you that's not quite where it ought to be. And all those things start pouring out with Zacchaeus. And, and, and that's what we get in Luke 19. I, I've, I've been dishonest. I've taken advantage of people. I'm going to pay back. I, I make restitution, make it right. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pour out this generous life on a community I have so robbed. 
But when Jesus gets to be your friend, you just start changing. When you get to know Jesus, uh, it, you, you know, I'm going to clean up my act and then get to know Jesus. It's not how it works. When you get to know Jesus, he starts changing you. When he changes the inside, the outside, it's naturally going to start shifting toward God's plan for your life. You know, one of my favorite, my favorite uh, songs is What a Friend We Have in Jesus. Just such a powerful testimony. And, and I know for, for me, uh, I'm a sinner. And this sinner needs a friend in Jesus. Sinners need a friend in Jesus. Zacchaeus needed a friend in Jesus. And he found just what, uh, just what he needed in Christ. So here's the thing about Jesus. He sees you not as you are, but, but what you can become. He sees you in terms of your faith, poten- terms of your faith potential. So here's Zacchaeus. Jesus looks up in the tree and he says, Zacchaeus, you need to come down from the tree. I'm going to your house. We're going to share a meal. We're going to share some time together. We're going to do some working on things together. The name Zacchaeus means pure. There's nobody who thought about Zacchaeus and thought pure in the same context. But Jesus looks at him, and maybe he's the first guy who really saw it for a very long time. And Jesus says, Zacchaeus, I don't see you in terms of who you are and your brokenness and your waywardness, your sinfulness. I see you in terms of what you could become, your faith potential. When I see you, I see pure. I see, I see a guy who is generous enough to open up that big bank account and make right all the things that have been so wrong for so long. There's a, I have made no, no qualms about this. I'm not a big fan of the feline community. I'm not a cat lover, money stretch. But there was a picture that one of, one of you that's more inclined that way, uh, there's a there's a picture, and in that picture, uh, it's, a, it's a kitten, which is the only time a cat has any redeeming values when it's very small. There's a kitten looking into a mirror, and the reflection that the, that the kitten sees in the mirror is this huge, ferocious lion. And, and I, I love that picture in this context. I look in the mirror, and I see everything that's wrong with me. And Jesus looks at me. He sees me in terms of what I could become when I surrender my life to him, when I lean into this relationship to him. He sees us in terms of what we could become. If some of you came in today and you're, you're, a, lot like, uh, you're a lot like Zacchaeus, you're seeking, searching for something, and listen, Jesus is here today, and he knows you, and he loves you, and he's calling you by name, and he says, I want to have a relationship with you, and I see you in terms of not where you are, where you've been, but to see in terms of what you could become, and it's beautiful. So for all us normal, seeking, sinful souls, would you come down from your tree today and let Jesus do a dramatic, transforming work in your life?